You just uh, grab a packet. <laughs> yeah, the the handout's right there next to you, June. Thank you. You're very welcome. So we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Um, I looked up, we have, including this one, there are four sessions that it'll take between three and three and a half to do. So we'll do this one this week. Um, and I think, I think next week I will just have the rest of it printed. That way we can go until we need to stop and just pick up there at the next week. Um, I, I think I can handle this during Lent. If I find out I'm wrong, we'll just delay it until the, the week or so after Easter and finish up. But I think we can finish during Lent and then uh, I can focus on Lent and then after Easter we can get whatever next started. And at that point, I would like to do the same thing here as McGregor, still stream hours like normal, and then just that way I'm not preparing two different things. Yeah, so if you have ideas, if you have suggestions, something you would like to cover, please let me know. Uh, and I can definitely consider that when weighing out what we do next. So uh, today we need to pull up the right screen so I can see what's going on. I guess first... Uh, I know we do have at least one in with us. Is the audio good? And I'll hang out a minute to make sure the audio is good before I get started. I figure you would have already typed if it wasn't, but we'll just make sure real quick. Well, I'm just going to assume we're good. So, so we, we last week we talked about baptism, and so this week we take up the other sacrament. We take up the sacrament of the altar, and Luther asks, what is the sacrament of the altar? And answers, it is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and to drink. And so if you remember our conversation last week, we talked about what makes a sacrament. What are the, what are the things that, that make a sacrament? And we said that it is the promise, the word of God attached to some physical means. And so for this, for the sacrament, we see the promise of God that is the the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation attached to bread and wine, that in this sacrament, uh, it is not simply bread and wine, but it is the body and blood of Christ. Um, of course, this is instituted in the upper room, the, the evening Christ is betrayed. And as St. Paul recaps what he was given by Christ himself, he says this in 1 Corinthians 11. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. So this isn't something he came up with. This isn't something the other apostles taught him. This is from Christ himself. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Remember, this takes place during the Passover meal. And so we should think about and remember what the Passover meal was. And what we'll see is how it was a type 
and a shadow of the sacrament which would come. The Passover was instituted as an annual feast, an annual ritual that memorialized, that that brought to our remembrance and also God's remembrance, the deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt. It consisted of ceremonial food. There was the lamb, which looked forward to the sacrifice of the promised Messiah. There was the unleavened bread. Unleavened because it was it was prepared in haste. And there was wine. And some of the earliest rituals, uh, liturgies of the Passover that we, we have, there were four cups of wine. And each of the cups represented an I will promise of God. And these are found in Exodus 6. And so this is what Moses records for us. He says, that, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So God promises that he will bring, he will deliver, he will redeem, and he will take. Now for the Israelites in that time and place, it dealt specifically with the uh, Egyptians and the eventual bringing of the nation into the promised land, but it also talks about how God, through Christ, through our Messiah, brings us out from under the burden of our sin, how he delivers us from the slavery we have to sin, that he redeems us through the blood of Christ, and when he is ready, will take us to himself, for he is our God. And so it kind of makes sense that our Lord institutes the supper at the Passover. Since the Passover is a foreshadow of his own death for the sin of the world, uh, it, it, it just makes sense. I thought I was going to be able to re reword that on the fly and i discovered that i couldn't so <laughs> uh, but the passover is a foreshadowing of christ's death remember it's it's the blood on the door frame that the angel of death the the avenger passes over and does not smite it is a memorial a remembrance that Christ of Christ's death, and it brings the benefit of that death to those who faithfully eat and drink. And so we should take and look at what Jesus says concerning the elements. First, Matthew records that he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Labatafagara, take Eat, this is my body. Mark says the same thing. Take it, this is my body. And Luke, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, do we take these words figuratively or literally? Well, St. Paul interprets it for us. The chapter before what we... Uh, read from him in chapter 11, he says, is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? And then what we did read, whoever eats the bread, or this is after what we read, whoever eats the bread in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body of the Lord. And so Paul, taking what the gospel writers has written and what Christ himself delivered to him proclaims that 
the bread is nothing other than the body of Christ. And that for those who take it faithfully, it is to their benefit. But there's a warning. Whoever eats it in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning against the Lord himself. Similarly, about the wine, Jesus says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And again, Paul interprets. He takes what Christ himself gave him and says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Therefore, whoever drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the blood of the Lord. And so Paul is indicating once again that this isn't simply wine. It is the blood of Christ. Remember the sacrament, the promise attached to an element. Now, there are three primary views, and I'm not going to say this is the only three, but for the most part, this is, this is what uh, is, is taught in Christian churches today. And those three views come from the Roman Catholic, the Reformed, and then our Lutheran view. So we begin with what the, the, the Roman church teaches. They teach something called transubstantiation. And if you can put those words together, trans means change, sub in the, so trans substance, so change in substance. The bread and wine under this view are changed into the body and blood of Christ at the word of institution. It has the form of bread, it has the taste of bread, the form and the taste of wine, but it's not bread and wine, it is the body and blood of Christ. And so, as the priest offers this, it is an unbloody sacrifice for the sins of both the living and the dead. And since the bread is no longer bread, it's the body of Christ, it is good and per permissible to adore this bread. And so if you've heard of the Corpus Christi procession, do you know what Corpus Christi means? It's the body of Christ. And so, uh, in fact, Corpus Christi, Texas, it's, it's, that's what it means. Um, so what they do is they, they have a, a box that they parade, uh, and as this parade, this procession goes, as it passes, the, the people observing this would adore uh, in a... Worship is too strong, but I'm going to use it to, to try to get my point across. Uh, it's... It's more than a simple reverence. So in, in many of our churches, there's a processional cross that's brought through at the beginning and end of the service. And you'll see many people as, as, it, uh, as it passes them, they'll, they'll bow. That is a bow of reverence, not a bow of, of adoration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the church I did my field work at, we had a processional cross in. Most of the year we had a gospel procession, and then, and then we processed out. Uh, the Reformed, or, or com more commonly the, the Reformed view, says that the bread and wine are simply symbols. There is no body of Christ in that bread and wine. It represents the body and blood. And so in this view, the celebration of the Lord's Supper simply confesses our faith in Christ and gives us a moment to remember his death. 
Now, there's nothing in itself wrong with that, but it's what is taken away from the supper that's that's the issue. Some would acknowledge that Christ is spiritually, but not physically, present in the sacrament. But this, phys- this, this spiritual presence is only there for the believers. It's only for the Christian as they contemplate the gift of Christ. And so if you are not a Christian and you happen to take it anyway, then it's just bread and wine and you don't get any benefit. Now, the church body that I come that I came from is closest to this view, but is is different. And so like this view, we did not see it as a sacrament. We saw it as an ordinance. It's something that, that God gave us that we're supposed to do. And so we do it. There was typically no words of institution. And if there were, it was just to read the passage and then say, and now we're going to take this uh, uh, bread and juice and we're going to pray over it that it represents or, or stands in for the body and blood of Christ that we would think about and remember or, or maybe feel bad about what he went through to give us our forgiveness. Now, the difference between this view and, and what I grew up with is there wasn't even a spiritual presence there. It was just a memorial meal. It was just cracker and grape juice. There was nothing special about it. There was no benefit to taking it. But if you took it wrongly, there was still the judgment because after all, Paul says, if you take it in an unworthy manner, you are under judgment. (coughs) And then there is the Lutheran view. Um, I'm not, I, I get, I get the in with and under, but I like how, how Luther says it better. But anyway, that the in with and under the bread, Christ gives us his true body. The bread is the medium, but there's no change of substance. And so, um, it, it is bread but Christ makes it his body. Same with the wine. In this, Christ gives us his true blood. And again, the wine is the medium, the vehicle, the means by which the blood is provided. The bloody and blood are truly present with and under the bread and wine whether you believe it or not. There is this real presence of Christ in his sacrament. Again, there's a word of God promised attached to these elements. And so with this body and blood, for the believer, Christ bestows the forgiveness of sin, life, salvation. But the unbeliever receives that same body and blood but it's to his own judgment. And so this is why we practice closed communion. It's not out of a haughty nature. It's not because we think we're better than everyone else. It's it's because if you confess something different than we do, coming to the altar, you are saying that you believe what we believe even if you don't. And if you are a member of a church body that, that, for example, doesn't believe that it's the body and blood of Christ, you're not discerning it. And so I would be giving you judgment, even if you are a Christian, because you don't believe what Christ says about it. And so this isn't, this isn't a, you're not good enough. This is Look, we, we know what we believe and we know what your church body believes and it's, and it's different. And so 
we can't pretend there's no difference where there is. If, and so it's, it's not a proclamation of you're not Christian. It's a proclamation of, hey, there's real differences here and we can't pretend there's not. Now the, the Reformed defend their interpretation. They, they defend their uh, figurative uh, not body and blood, not physically present. And the way that they do this is say, when Jesus says, this is my body, if he's holding bread, he says, this is my body. So he's pointing and speaking of himself and not the bread in his hand. Further, when he says is, he doesn't mean is, he, meant, he means represents. And so this is my body and this represents my body. And of course, my body isn't actually my body. It's, it's a picture. It's something figurative of my body and blood. Now we take the words literally, not, fi not figuratively. And the reason is we interpret the words literally unless the context compels us to do otherwise. So Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a, uh, a hen gathers her chicks? Now, Jesus isn't calling himself a chicken. It is clearly, interp uh, clearly figurative language. There's nothing in the institution that indicates that Jesus is speaking figuratively. There's no reason in the plain reading of the text that he is talking about something figurative. The word is doesn't mean represents. There's other words that we could use. So if Jesus meant that it was a representation, he could have said, this bread is like my body. This blood is like my blood or similar to, but he doesn't. He says it is. So a question sure. on that side 15, that's not the Lutheran view. That's the reform view. Correct. Am I, okay, I Correct. Because it followed the Lutheran view slide. Yeah. But I wanted to make sure I understood. Yeah, that. yeah, absolutely. Um, remember that St. Paul an inspired writer of Holy Scripture says that what he is writing isn't his own thoughts, but it's what Christ himself told him. And because he believed what Christ told him, he wrote and believed that it was the actual body and the actual, or the, the bread was actual body and the blood was actual, or the, the wine was actual blood. In Jesus' words itself, it is carefully and intentionally stated. It was his last will and testament, so to speak. He says, this is the new covenant, the new testament. In your will, you don't make jokes. You don't introduce ambiguity. You are clear. And so if Jesus was intending us to take it figuratively, he did a bad job. Because that's not how you deal with wills and covenants and testaments. And then there's the whole first 15 year or 1500 years of the church. The church took what Jesus said as literal that it was the body and blood until the Radical Reformation, until the Anabaptists and the Reformed come along. And so if the entire church was confused for 1,500 years, Jesus didn't speak clearly. And again, in a will, you speak clearly. 
And so why is it that he gives us this body and blood? It's because his body bore our sins and his blood washes them away. And so recognizing this body and blood is the firmest assurance that we have that our sins are actually and truly forgiven. And so, how do we explain this? Well, see, the thing is, when God doesn't explain it, we take it by faith. And this is why the Reformed have the the position that they do. It doesn't make rational, logical sense. And so they have to come up with a way that it makes rational, common sense. It's the same thing with the idea of predestination. God says he predestined those who he chose, that he does not will or desire that anyone should perish, that he would desire that all come to faith, but we know that that's not the case. And so there's this mystery, there's this paradox, apparent paradox, and we say, I don't fully understand it, but it's what God says, and so I accept it. The Reformed say, well, if this, then that. So if this is the case, then then this has to be the case too. We believe on the basis of God's word, not on a deduction of reason. This is a serious matter. And it's because it's denying what Christ himself said. It's not saying Paul was in error. It's saying Christ was in error. And so Paul says that those who do not discern the body eat and drink judgment on themselves. And when you think of these church bodies that that don't believe what God says it is, is kind of scary. On the other hand, um, the church bodies that that say it's not the body and blood, it's just a memorial meal, typically don't use wine. They use grape juice. There is no, their ceremony is a simple prayer. There's no verba. There's no words of institution. There's, um, for lack of a better way to say it, there's no invoking God to act. And so because they don't believe it's what God says it is, they're not asking God to be there and, and act. They're not using the proper elements I think that it's in God's mercy that they don't have the sacrament. And so they really are just having a snack and and not having anything that will actually harm them. Now, that is my opinion. I could be wrong, but that's that's how how I see it, that it's actually a mercy of God preventing this judgment. But we do have a benefit. We've talked about how there's a consequence to to the misuse. There is a benefit. It's given for you. It's poured out for the forgiveness of sin. And so we confess that we receive the forgiveness of sin. We receive it by faith. The gospel is always received by faith and rejected by unbelief. And so the blessings in the Holy Supper are received through believing the words, through believing that this is my body given for you, that this is my blood of the new covenant poured out and given for you for the forgiveness of sin. And so those who do not believe it is what it is, that, that come to the altar and say, yeah, you're kind of silly and superstitious thinking this is blood and wine or uh, body and blood. I'm just going to take this bread and wine and and have my own special rem- remembrance. Um, they 
they don't receive what they think they are. Those who do not repent of their sins or think they need forgiveness. Those that don't believe that what God promises to deliver is delivered. And those who harbor anger against their neighbor, those who refuse to forgive and be reconciled to their fellow Christian, these are who will take it unworthily. I, I, yeah, I think that's the one that happens, at least in our circles, that's what happens more often than in others. Yeah. Which brings to mind, I don't remember, I know it's, it's a Trinity season gospel lesson, but I don't remember exactly what it is, but it talks about how Jesus, it may be on the, it may be in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus talks about if you're bringing your gift to the altar and remember that someone has something against you, leave your gift, go be reconciled, and then come. The judgments are also laid out. Paul says that's why many of you are weak and sick, and it gets worse, and a number of you have fallen asleep, which is which is how a Christian speaks of death. Now, he's not saying that the, these people who have died are condemned, but he is saying that because of their misuse, God took them. Um, and it may well be so that they didn't lose their faith. And so how should we examine ourselves? Well, first, in your catechism, uh, there should be uh, about a three or four page thing called uh, Christian Questions and Their Answers. That is something that's fantastic to occasionally go through. But you examine yourself. Why am I here? What am I receiving? Do I need it? That kind of thing. And so this is, this is kind of going through those 20 questions. Review the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not that well, huh? Well, confess how you're doing poorly. Then think on what Jesus is promising you here. And ask yourself if you believe those words. If you are assured that the forgiveness of sin is actually given. And then you pray that God would sustain you. Um, again, the, the Christian questions and answers uh, in the newest catechism is pages 37 through 40. I don't know about the older ones. Mm -hmm. Is that the blue one? Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah. So we ask, how often do we do this? Now, our custom is weekly. Jesus says, do this in memory of me. The Greek says, keep on doing this. And so there's not a specific do this X often, just do it. In Acts 2, after the day of Pentecost, we read that they, the, the Christians, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The breaking of bread is, is another way of saying the sacrament of the altar. And so there's not a frequency given on how often you have to do it. The early church celebrated it at least every Sunday. Um, the church that I grew up in said that you must do it every week. And the reason is in Acts chapter 20 in verse 7, it says, uh, Luke writes, we gathered on the first day of the week to break bread or 
I'm paraphrasing. And because there's a there's a uh, mention of meeting on the first day of the week to do this, they that my my old church kind of takes that example and and makes it a this is what you shall do. Um, but again, there's no demand on how often. The early church did it at least on Sunday. That's what we do at our congregation. Um, and my kind of question is, why Why wouldn't you want that? I remember when, when I was in the field, I was given once a month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the my previous congregation, um, it was... I, I had I had members that were old enough to remember when it was once a quarter, yeah. okay. and and the reasoning behind that is is in areas like ours and especially in areas like where I came from in in South Dakota is you had the circuit rider, and so the circuit rider would be based out of here, but he would travel all over the countryside to the different preaching stations. And whenever he was there, they'd have communion, and he was there about once a quarter. Well, they got used to that frequency, and so when there was a permanent pastor there, they just continued what they were used to rather than uh, returning to what the historic practice is. And I think it was in the mid-'90s at convention, um, there was a resolution passed encouraging our congregations to to begin returning to every Sunday communion. And in some places that's really took and hold and in some places it hasn't. Uh, I'm not saying congregations that do it less often are are um, wrong. Uh, I I would I would think that it's not a uh, I hate to use this word because it's business speak, but uh, a best practice. Um, so, um, there is in the Augsburg Confession, in Article 24 on the Mass, this. This is what our, this is what uh, Melanchthon wrote and this is what was presented to Prince Charles in in uh 1530 25 I don't remember the date but it says at the outset we must again make the preliminary statement that we do not abolish the mass we do not abolish the sacrament the the holy supper but religiously maintain and defend it For among us, masses are celebrated every Lord's Day and on the other festivals. So on Epiphany, so on Ascension, on any feast day that falls in the week in which the sacrament is offered to those who wish to use it after they have been examined and absolved and the usual public ceremonies are observed, the series of lessons, so we maintain the lectionary of prayers, vestments, and other like things. And so the Lutheran pastors and princes from the very beginning operated under the assumption that the minimum frequency of the supper was every Sunday and on festivals during the week. We should, as Christians, desire communion often because, well, we're commanded to do it often. We have the example of the apostolic church meeting and sharing this regularly. We have the promised blessing that is given to us that we would be strengthened spiritually and that we confess our faith as we do this, every time you eat and drink, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is not simply a refreshment. It is a confession of faith. In general, 
um, the sacrament is to be offered corporately to the, the church. But it is also right and responsible to administer the sacrament, to provide the sacrament to um, more than that. So it is a community meal. It's to be taken by believers. And if you can't come to the community, then it's taken to you. So if you're shut in, if you're in the hospital, if you're detained for some other reason, um, it is brought to you. And one thing that I've, I've started doing is uh, the, first, the first couple of years, I would commune the person that I was meeting with, but I wouldn't commune with them. And I, I, at some point I decided, you know, this is a community meal. And so shouldn't I be taking it along with them? And so I, I started doing that. Church members may receive, request to receive communion privately before in special circumstances. So if you're going to go into surgery, if you're going to be in a hospital stay, you're going to have some kind of long recovery at home. Perhaps you're, uh, perhaps you're traveling and there won't be a church around you. It's proper to request it at that point. Um, when, when I had my first heart issue three plus years ago, um, at that time, my congregation did not have weekly communion. And that Sunday was a non-communion Sunday. And because it was a non-communion Sunday and Hannah was going into the hospital Monday on Monday to uh, be get ready for her inducement, we had arranged for her to have communion before the before the the C-section. Um, but then I got sick and I'm in the hospital bed. I'm in, I, I'm in the heart hospital ICU thinking here I am. And I didn't even have the opportunity to have communion today. And it, it just really weighed on me because I knew I wanted it weekly, but I also knew the congregation wasn't ready for it. And so I wasn't pushing for it. Man, it, 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 it did not feel good to be in the hospital on a Sunday knowing that I had not had communion and knowing that I needed it. Um, we should talk about the responsible administration. The church, the church does not administer this blessing indiscriminately. The, the Holy Supper is not the seed that the sower throws out. And so I kind of went over this, but we deny not out of pride, but out of love to those who have not been properly instructed concerning the faith and especially the Lord's Supper. We do not provide it to those who deny the real presence that deny the benefits that Christ has for us. Those who lead openly impenitent lives and those who are unable to properly examine themselves. And so again, we're not saying you're not a Christian to those we don't uh, uh, allow to come to the table. We're saying that in your life, or your confession, there is something that I have to say as a pastor, I could be doing harm to you if I give you this. Explain that last bullet. Uh, more. Unable to. So, so Annie and Evie. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're baptized. They're Christian. But they don't know what's going on. And so rather than give them something that they don't understand... I give them the blessing at the at the rail. I guess I was thinking about special needs adults. It, so yeah, they, it could involve that too. So if they even think they can examine themselves, they wouldn't. Right, right. And and some uh I, I haven't personally had this, but I do know of people that 
when I guess I technically do have this um, when when they're when they're with someone that has a special need or is a, a, a dementia patient and they're talking to them, you have to decipher whether they understand what's going on or not. Or if they if they were and then they had a car accident and then the mm -hmm. whole mind changed. Right. Right. Yeah. And then possibly it's possibly it is possible. Um, it's it's always my desire to provide, yeah. but if if you're having a bad day that day and you don't know who I am and you don't know why I'm there and you're not really responding uh, appropriately to to my questions, well. I'm not going to say you're unchristian, but but right now you're not in a in a state where I can confidently say you would receive this worthily. So again, it's not a punishment; it's it's a protection. Um. The Lord's Supper assumes a unity in faith and confession. Um, again, at, at, my, at my previous congregation, when I was teaching on this, the question was, was asked, well, my, you know, my child or children was baptized here, confirmed here, and married here, but they go to this other church now. Why can't they... Uh, you know, I know what they believe. Why can't they um, take it here? And I go, well, what does their church believe? Does their church believe what we say? Does their church believe uh, truly or falsely on various doctrines? Well, I know what church they go to. And so whether they believe it or not, whether their pastor believes it or not, their church body, says things that are that are wrong, false, dangerous, apostate. And so if I were to allow them to commune here, we would be saying these differences don't matter. Um, just like I wouldn't be able to commune my own family because they don't believe what we believe. And I can't pretend it doesn't matter. It does matter. It doesn't mean they're not Christian. I believe they are. But we can't pretend it doesn't matter. They, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. And so they made sure you believed the proper things. Paul writes, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. And so a contradictory confession destroys the integrity of that oneness. And so people who profess doctrine contrary to the Lutheran confessions break that oneness, and so we ask them not to partake with us. And our members are reminded that if you find yourself in a church that, that has contrary teachings to ours, that you refrain from taking it. Because again, if you went to that altar, you're saying that it doesn't matter that we're different. Questions? See if we have anything from the interwebs. Um, it's it's lamentable that we don't. It's something that we have. It, it's it's truly a loss. Um, it's yeah it, the. In the Reformation, the, the corporate confession and absolution that we have before our services would have been completely foreign, would have been just 
unthinkable to them. And I remember back when I was a kid, people would go to the pasture the night before. Yep. Before. Yep. Unless, because we lived so far out, and sometimes I'd go to church, but I'd, sometimes right before church, they would meet the pastor. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the, the church that I did my vicarage at, some of the more elderly members could remember scheduling a time to come in and meet with the pastor and register and then go home and then come back the next day for, for service. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's sad that we've lost it. And so what would you do? Would you discuss your sins or admit what you did wrong? So it would be an opportunity for, for private confession, but in general, it would be, um, I mean, obviously I've, I wasn't alive, let alone a pastor during this time. But my understanding is you would come in and say, Pastor, we're planning on coming to communion tomorrow. And I would say, that's great. Let's talk for a minute. How has the week been? How, what have you done this week? What have you been thinking or doing? Or do you have any concerns? Do you, is anything weighing on you? And through that discussion, um, say, well, there's an opportunity based on our our conversation, there's now an opportunity to confess your sins and receive the absolution. Um, and, and even when you look at our, our hymnal, it, it says uh, something to the, if I have it with me. So, um, we, you may prepare yourself by meditating on the Ten Commandments. You may also pray the penitential psalms. If you are not burdened with particular sin, do not trouble yourself or search or invent others, thereby turning confession into torture. Instead, mention one or two sins that you know and let that be enough. And so uh, it might be, um, this week, I know that I got mad at my son. I know that I disrespected my, my employer. And so I humbly ask God to, to forgive me of these sins and strengthen me where I don't do it anymore. But maybe there's something really going on inside your heart that's really burdening you. And so you say, you know, there's, there's the little stuff that we all do that we don't even realize, but, but let me tell you what's, what's really weighing on me right now. This, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I allow them to confess that sin. Um, I give whatever counsel and direct and comfort. And then I lay my hand on them and uh, say, so do you believe that my forgiveness is God's forgiveness? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. And so he places his hands on the head of the penitent and says, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. And so it's, it's more than um, I... I knelt and I was silent for five seconds to let you run through anything you want to confess to God. And now this blanket, you're all forgiven. It's this, this one-on-one, -on -one, um, God has heard your confession. God forgives you of your sin. Go in peace. Well, those sessions could be quite lengthy. It could, it, yeah, it, it could be a couple of minutes. It, it could be, yeah, yeah. It just kind of depends on, on what that individual needs. Yeah. And he might walk in and say, hey, pastor, I want to take communion tomorrow, but I've got a question on whatever doctrine. Mm -hmm. And so we discuss that doctrine. So it's not necessarily a family or a couple. It'd be individual. It, it could be, it could be either. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Um, like if, like if, let, let, let's say, let's say uh, I am, let's say Hannah and I are, are members and, and let's just say Pastor Poise is still here. And so we would come, I might say, All right, Pastor, I, I need to confess something to you, just you and me. Yeah. And so Hannah would go out, we would do that, she'd come back in. Or the opposite. She says, I need to tell you something and I'd like it to be in confidence. Yeah. I leave and then come back yeah. when they're ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this much more personal than I always thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even, even daily, like when you, between the time when you say the silent prayer, if you have something to confess, you kneel at the altar. We used to kneel in the... I, I miss kneelers. We used to kneel right in the... Well, we didn't have kneelers, but you got down the fight, or you just followed the next to them thing if you couldn't get down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In that Everybody was down yeah. Somewhere. Yep. Showing Yeah. I missed that too. Yeah. Yeah. And not everyone can do that. <laughs> but but I I wish it was available to those who could and wanted to. Yeah. Anything else? Um if you go back to where, if, what did you take only one of the second? That's, what are you really accomplishing? Anything? I mean, I know you have it just once. <clears throat> um, yeah, we're, we're given to, to have both. Yeah. Um, I've, there have been times that, that I gave someone the host and didn't know until later that I didn't give them the wine. I did not intentionally keep it from them. I didn't know I did it. Um, they, they received what they received in faith. And so I have no reason to think they didn't receive um, forgiveness. It would have been better for me to give both. Um, but to intentionally withhold, that's dangerous. Because at that point you're saying, Jesus said this, but I'm going to give you only that part. But at that point you're a judge. <laughs> you're judging them. Yeah, yeah, you really are. Yeah. Okay, well, if nothing else, uh, why don't we close with the Lord's Prayer and then we'll, uh, let me see, what is next week? Let me remember here. Um, Next week is prayer. So we'll take a look at prayer next week. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you for being here this morning and we'll look forward to next